Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Edward Statton, and I'll be hosting this webcast news conference on behalf of the John Templeton Foundation. The Templeton Prize, which has brought us all together here today, is, as uh, some of you will know, one of the world's largest annual awards made to an individual. It's worth £1.1 million. And it's given to a living person who's made an exceptional contribution to affirming life's spiritual dimension through insight, discovery, or practical works. It's awarded by the John Templeton Foundation, and it's the cornerstone, indeed, of the Foundation's international efforts to serve as a philanthropic catalyst for discoveries relating to the big questions of human purpose and ultimate reality. And I am delighted to say we have a former winner in our audience today, Colonel Michael Bordeaux, here at the front. Uh, received the Templeton Prize, I think, 30 years ago, wasn't it? 1984? Exactly 30 years ago. Exactly 30 years ago. Well, welcome this morning. Um, Colonel Bordeaux is the founder of the Keston Institute, an organisation which is dedicated to the study of religion in formerly communist countries, which, as you will very shortly see, uh, makes his presence very pertinent to the announcement we're making um, today. We'll hear more about the meaning of the prize and its significance in a moment or two, but um, I want now you to imagine me opening a metaphorical envelope with a flourish to announce the winner of the 2014 Templeton Prize. Um, well, here he is, in fact, sitting on my left, um, Monsignor Professor Tom Ash Halleck. Many congratulations. Um, we, we, we'll hear from Professor Halleck himself in a moment or two, but um, I'm going to embarrass you by saying a little bit about you and your, your qualification for this honour. Uh, Thomas Halleck is, is a Czech priest and a philosopher, and he risked imprisonment by trying to advance religious and, religious and cultural freedoms after the Soviet and Warsaw Pact invasion of his country crushed the Prague Spring of 1968. He was condemned by the communist authorities as an enemy of the regime, uh, and was banned from his teaching job, but he still spent nearly, I think, two decades quietly organising and building an extensive secret network of academics, theologians, philosophers and students. And today he is a leading international advocate for dialogue among different faiths and most notably uh, including non-believers. And in particular he's proposed that the long intellectual tradition of Catholicism puts it in a good position to bridge uh, Western secularism, traditional religion, and indeed Islamic culture. Um, we'll hear more about you and from you in a moment or two, but we're also delighted to have the Czech ambassador to the United Kingdom with us this morning. Thank you so much for coming, Michael Zantowski. And as, again, we'll discover in a moment or two, he has personal as well as patriotic reasons to be very pleased about uh, this morning's prize. Finally, let me introduce Dr. John M. Templeton, Jr., who's the president and chairman of the John Templeton Foundation, which was created by his father, the late global investor and philanthropist, Sir John Templeton. Um, today, he directs all the activities of the foundation. Uh, Sir John founded the Templeton Prize in 1972, and Professor Halleck is, I think, the 44th uh, Prize Laureate. Um, Dr. Templeton, would you like to say a few words? Thank you. Thank you, Edward. Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate that. My only regret is Dad is not here to meet all of you. And Ambassador Zantowski, thank you so much for being here with the busy schedule that you have. Uh, and also Professor Hollig, thank you so much. And we will share that in just a moment as Dad would love to do himself. So ladies and gentlemen, good morning to all of you. This is a blessing that you all are here for us, more perhaps than for you, but perhaps if you pick up something today, it may be a blessing that you can share with others. So on behalf of the trustees and my colleagues at the John Templeton Foundation, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you gathered here today, and also to those of you who are watching online, because that is at the same very time that we will be talking and sharing things. We hope, therefore, to get some responses from you all. So this is the 214th Templeton Prize Templeton Congress. It's a great joy and privilege to be here at the historic British Academy in central London and to announce the nine Templeton Prize judges representing a wide range of disciplines, cultures, and religious traditions who have chosen the 19, 2014 Templeton Prize laureate. Once senior to Tomasz Halleck, he has served many persons today that we will learn about more momentarily. That includes just one formal 
but very important part of the things that he does as professor of sociology of religion in the Faculty of Art in the Department of Religious Studies at Charles University's in Prague, the Czech Republic. As one of the most notable and invocable winners, Professor Halleck becomes, as we noticed, the 44th winner of the Templeton Prize, since my father, the late John Templeton, a global investor, but also in many ways a mental optimist, therefore created this prize, which has evolved in such extraordinary ways uh, over just uh, the number of years since 72. So John's vision for the prize has always fostered a pursuit of discovery, most especially the seeking of new insights into the limitless potentials of the realm of the spirit. The essence of this vision is what Sir John summarized both as mental progress and likewise spiritual progress. Sir John emphasized that the prize would, identif would identify entrepreneurs of the spirit, that is those who devote their talents to expanding our vision of the intangible and deeper realities of human purpose and ultimate reality. If Sir John were still with us today in honoring Professor Hay Leek, he would offer the words he emphasized in honor of a previous winner. Those words included, no person may even know 1% of the infinite creative spirit. To learn anything, we must first become humble and rid ourselves of the egotistical idea that we already know everything about God. The optimal context for this vision is to encourage an open-minded spirit of humility. Many last laureates have typically been characterized not by claims always of final answers, but instead by the discipline and the adventure of endless questions. So John stressed that questions when framed in humility create an open mind which in turn makes it possible for us to learn and especially to learn from each other and often see new glimpses of a larger timeless truth. In turn, such glimpses become major beneficial contributors to progress on its own endless footage if only people wake up their eyes with curious and joy in learning ongoing answers to various questions. As always, a larger, more projected optimist, my father foresaw a day when new information on research on spiritual realities might reduce conflict between all religions. He felt that from such research, people would come to acknowledge a rich diversity of spiritual information which universally accessible or should be accessible to all persons. Thus, in this way, it is hoped that all religions will embrace both Sir John's vision, but also our foundation's motto, how little we know, how eager to learn. Therefore, in reflection on Professor Heilek's remarkable life's work, I would like to offer for all of us just a bit of some of his notable contributions. For example, Professor Halleck shares my father's vision for spiritual progress. He demonstrates this in so many ways. First, he has rigorously pursued intellectual investigations of mind and spirit. He also relentlessly asks questions without seeking only simple answers. He has worked tirelessly to explore innovative ways to think about and convey timeless truths to others so that other people of all spiritual and cultural backgrounds, even atheists, might find new and deeper ways to express them. Shortly after receiving his PhD in philosophy, sociology from Charles University in Prague in 1972, Professor High Tech was condemned by the communist government of Czechoslovakia as an enemy of the regime. Over the next two decades, he helped to organize and build an extensive secret network of academics, theologians, philosophers, and students who especially cultivated the intellectual spiritual foundations for the democratic state he envisioned. He risked imprisonment on his best participation in his underground university and his underground church, but he and his colleagues were determined to always create the moral and spiritual biosphere, which is his own way of framing the larger sense of how the mind and the spirit can grow, were then to prepare the Czech society for a life in freedom. He served as a close advisor to the future president, Vyacheslav Halevel, and he helped the, the Archbishop of Prague 
Cardinal Tomeshek to compose his pastoral letters to the laity and also open letters to the government, both being initial symbols of his moral um, opposition to the communist regime. Following the regime, the freedoms of the Velvet uh, Revolution in the late 1989s, Pope John Paul II invited Professor Harlech to the Vatican to help to prepare the Pope to visit Czechoslovakia in 1990. The Pope also appointed him to serve as an advisor to the Pontifical Council for Dialogue for non-believers. Since that time, through his many books and lectures, Professor Halleck has shared his ideas and beliefs among followers of, of widely varying cultural and spiritual traditions, and notably between both believers and non-believers. Professor Hylex considers his audience to be many people who are believers and non-believers at the same time, much like the man in Gospel, Mark, chapter 9, verse 24, who cries out, I believe, help my unbelief. He calls for the church to seek the seekers, and yet he also asks those who seek to have patience with God. He openly confesses that he too feels in his words crucified between the paradoxes of the secular world and the world of religion and speaks of his own experience being on the edges of belief and unbelief. Thus Professor Halleck asks many questions in his quest for spiritual progress. One of the big questions which you can view in our website is www.templetonprize.org. He challenged us by asking, is God the answer or rather a question? He states so probingly, answers without questions are like trees without roots. But how often are Christian truths presented to us that, like felled, lifeless trees which birds can no longer find a nest? Further, he said, only the confrontation of questions and answers can return a real meaning and dynamic to our statements. Truth happens in the course of dialogue. He further said, we must shift from apparently final answers back to infinite questions. Questions are sometimes more important than answers. There are questions that are so good that it is a pity to spoil them with answers. Today, we celebrate the Templeton Prize and more than 40 years of spiritual progress. So thereby, we offer homage that Sir John himself would happily do to, Mon to Monsignor Professor Thomas Halleck without risking further prison to the mind of those in the nation or daring to engage views that are keepers of the faith would shun as heretical, Professor Halleck is to continue opening vistas that advance human rights and then humans' opportunities when they do open their mind and their spirits. Rising to these challenges, he inspires us all to break free of repression, even if it's still somewhat affected by government, but instead, to open our minds as well as our minds and our hearts. He will share with us some of the things that he would see already is a part of the tradition of the Templeton Prize, but for Sir John Templeton, every winner each year was a blessing because of a wider sense, a way to think where other people haven't thought, maybe even a way that an individual as a winner wasn't thinking even two years ago. That's the blessing that he is brought not only in his own culture, and we hope so much as by the way of this prize that he will offer more and more people in the world. So now we want to thank you all for being with us and thank you for all your service to God and to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Templeton. Um, I said that the, the Czech ambassador had a particular reason to be pleased about this announcement uh, because Michael Zantowski and Monsignor Thomas were childhood friends, interestingly, and went to university together at uh, Charles University in Prague. Mr. Zantowski is, I think I should say, something of a polymath, um, a psychologist, a translator, a politician, and now a diplomat, ambassador. Well, thank you. <coughs> it is a great honor and a pleasure to be here at the British Academy today for the announcement of the 2014 laureate of the Templeton Prize. It is actually a double pleasure, as already been indicated, because not only is this most prestigious prize being awarded to a citizen of my country, but also because it goes to a good friend of mine, Tomasz. 
As the ambassador to the United Kingdom and earlier to the United States, I have followed with great interest both the remarkable career of Sir John Templeton and the philanthropic activities of the Templeton Foundation. I have, as, I have always held in high esteem the commitment of Sir John, his family and collaborators to promote the insights, research and discoveries in the area of human spirituality. I could not attend the award ceremony last year, but I was there two years ago to see the prize go to His Holiness the Dalai Lama, whom it has been my privilege to know for the last 25 years. And I'm particularly happy that Tomasz Halik, a priest, theologian, philosopher and psychologist and sociologist, is to join the group of very distinguished personalities who have received the prize. As it has been said, Tomasz and I go back quite some time. Actually, uh, our fathers, who were both literary scholars, had been friends before we were friends. So uh, we knew about each other since childhood and since the end of the 60s, we were both students of uh, psychology and in Tomasz's case also of philosophy at uh, the Charles University uh, in Prague. And in the years that followed, uh, we both attended some clandestine or semi-clandestine seminars and meetings and training sessions that took place under the depressive shroud of the so-called normalization followed the Soviet occupation of Czechoslovakia in August 1968. And in the course of time, I, I remember I became aware that Tomasz had another agenda going beyond and above our goal of mastering the skills of Gestalt therapy or whatever it was at uh, that time. And in those days, one did not ask direct questions about such things because the less you knew, the fewer secrets you could inadvertently give away. Uh, but I remember I suspected that Tomáš was training as a psychoanalyst, something strictly forbidden during the communist days. And only much later did I realize that he was cleverly insinuating a psychoanalytic indoctrination which was bad enough to hide the fact that he was training as a priest, which was much worse. <laughs> <laughs> well, I went on to spend the next 10 years of my life in a mental institution, which I always say was the best training for a career in politics and diplomacy, <laughs> while Tomasz followed with brilliant results his spiritual uh, vocation. And as Dr. Templeton already mentioned, we were both close to one man who epitomized the values of spirituality, tolerance, and the goals of what in Hebrew is called tikkun olam, which is sometimes translated as betterment of, betterment of the world or repairing of the world, goals that would perhaps, uh, Václav, that Václav Havel would perhaps consider too arrogant and would have preferred the translation of healing the world. Václav Havel, the former president of Czechoslovakia and uh, the Czech Republic was a great uh, model and a great uh, friend to both of us. While I was Havel's spokesman and political director, Tomáš was one of his spiritual interlocutors. And since the start, we have been both involved in uh, a number of projects, including Havel's project of the Forum 2000, an international gathering based on very much the same considerations and objectives as the Templeton's Prize. Tomasz is one of the several people who work to promote the legacy and, uh, and follow up on the work of our great countryman and uh, friend whom we both miss almost every day. So for that reason, I'm convinced that in Tomasz, a tireless thinker, a prolific writer, a spiritual guide, the Templeton Prize is finding a very worthy recipient. Thank you. <laughs> Ambassador, thank you, thank you very much indeed um, for those remarks. I actually met our prize winner for the first time yesterday 
And you said two things to me about today's date. Mm -hmm. um, it's the first anniversary of the election of Pope Francis, who, I'm not sure if I get into trouble for saying this, but who you said was the Pope you'd always hoped for. Um, but more somberly, it's also the anniversary of the death of one of your teachers, who was, I think, Patochka. pretty much beaten to death by the secret police mm -hmm. in 1977. Um, Monsignor, would you like to say a few words? Uh, Dr. Templeton, Madam Templeton, uh, Your Excellency, Mr. Ambassador, dear Mike, uh, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, when St. Augustine uh, was asked which three paths led most surely to God, he replied, the first is humility, the second is humility, and the third is humility. Becoming a Templeton Prize winner is a great test of humility. <laughs> uh, when I read the list of all previous win uh, winners, names which for years I have spoken with respect and admiration, I certainly felt small and humble when compared with them. Thank you for this opportunity to experience humility so profoundly. Uh, I would like to recall with gratitude today my teachers of philosophy and theology, many of whom spent long years in communist prison camps and had very little opportunity uh, to write or publish. I am grateful to them for their intellectual, spiritual and moral inspiration, for their witness of faith, courage, perseverance and wisdom. They each bore a cross, whereas I today am able to experience the joy and light of the Easter morning, the resurrection of freedom. This enormous honor obliged me to carry forward this light and joy for all people of goodwill. I'm glad that London is the place chosen for today's event. Ever since my first step along the path to Christian faith, I have been profoundly influenced by the distinguished tradition of English Christianity, from the medieval mysticism to the thinkers and novelists of the 20th century. The works of Chesterton and Graham Greene demonstrated to me the paradoxical aspect of Christianity. I'm deeply convinced that the chief task of faith and theology is to teach us the art of living amid the life's paradoxes and the courage to enter the cloud of unknowing. The world we live in is deeply ambivalent and full of paradoxes, and therefore it offers scope for various interpretations, both religious and atheistic. Pascal wrote, there is light enough for those who wish to believe and darkness enough for those who choose the other alternative. God does not take away from us the freedom and responsibility implicit in our choice. Nevertheless, in my book and lectures, I seek uh, to show respect for those who have difficulties with many aspects of present-day religion and atheism. In today's world, we encounter a self-assured religious fundamentalism as well as a no less arrogant and naive uh, militant atheism. I regard both these extremes, which greatly resemble each other, as a blind alley of cultural evolution. My heart is on the side of those who are seekers. Among believers, there are many people whose faith is not a buttressed fortress, but a path. They respond to the call to go deeper and deeper, and likewise among those who do not consider themselves believers, there are many who are not dwellers 
in the house of dogmatic atheism and who are not blind to life's spiritual dimension. They too are seekers. Moreover, many of those who wrestle with God are probably closer to God than many conventional and conformist believers. For everyone who reads the Bible, it doesn't come to a surprise that God loves those who wrestle with him. Thanks to Cardinal Newman, I came to realize that tradition is a dynamic process of constant reinterpretation of the treasure of the faith. I felt a close affinity with John Henry Newman, both as a churchman and an academic. I'm convinced that today's church ought to be inspired by the idea of the medieval university. The university was then perceived as a community of teachers and pupils, community of life, learning, and prayer. Truth was to be sought by means of free discussion, where everything could be propounded as a questio disputata. Nevertheless, a crucial principle was the linkage between intellectual activity and the spiritual component of life. Contemplata alis tradere. Uh, Carla Newman's emphasis of dignity and the priority of conscience deeply resonated with my Czech cultural heritage, influenced by Jan Hus, John Haas, who was a martyr of conscience. One indication of the truthfulness and maturity of a face is the extent to which a face created space for conscience, the extent to which it illuminates, encourages, and fortifies. A, mat a mature face helps conscience mature. An immature face does not trust conscience and demands simplistic black and white answers to complex questions. Saint Augustine asks, uh, where can I invite you to my God? My answer is a humble prayer, my God, loving Father of all people, enter the sanctuary of our conscience and teach our conscience to listen to your voice. Teach us to understand uh, what you say amid the noise of the world. Teach us to read and understand the signs of the times. If I understand rightly Sir John Templeton's purpose, he sought to create from generation to generation, regardless of national, cultural, and religious boundaries, a community of men and women who have tried to understand the signs of the times in their epoch and to open their minds and hearts to the blowing of the spirit. Today, I enter humbly and with gratitude into this community of men and women whose first members included such saintly individuals as Mother Teresa and Brother Roger Schitz. There is one thing, maybe, that unites us all in spite of our differences. It is the idea that inspired Sir John Templeton's noble undertaking, namely that the awareness that is necessary for life of individuals and society constantly to cultivate the spiritual dimension. The common dwelling of our civilization would be caught and inhospitable where the fire of the spirit absent from it. Reason is a great gift from God and science and technology are among the pillars of our civilization, but rationality without any spiritual and moral impulses from the depth of faith could be a dangerous explosive. In a novel by Czech writer Karel Čapek, the inventor of explosive substance eventually receives an instruction. You wanted to do great things and you will do 
small things instead. You will do something that will bring light and warmth. At the time of the Velvet Revolution, 25 years ago, my friend Václav Havel expressed the hope that truth and love would triumph over lies and hatred. That is an enormous and difficult task for the entire remainder of history. In the rest of my life, I would like to do small things that would bring light and warmth to people in our world. So, help me God. Thank you very much indeed, Monsignor. Um, I've got lots I want to ask you, but I've already had a go, so I'm, I won't, I won't monopolise you. Um, let me invite some questions from the floor, uh, gentlemen here. I'd just say, if I could, um, if you can identify yourself and your organisation and just wait for the mic, because although people in the room can obviously hear the, uh, the webcast, audience will need to hear the mic. Yes, go ahead. Uh, hello, my name is Jiří Hošek. I'm a correspondent of Czech Radio here in the UK. Uh, congratulations to Professor Halík. Of course, the name of uh, late Václav Havel was already mentioned. Um, you fully deserve the prize. It's an individual prize. But to what extent do you view it, and probably a question also to Ambassador Žantovský, as indirect recognition of the legacy of Václav Havel as well? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I, I think for WhatsApp it was very important uh, to connect uh, politics with, with the moral uh, dimension of life and also for the spiritual dimension of life. So uh, part of his legacy is this um, tradition of uh, the conference in Forum 2000. Uh, the part of this is the interreligious meetings and uh, I was always um, uh, a good responsibility for this part of the, of the conference and we hosted many important uh, spiritual and religious leaders. So I think it is the part of uh, the culture of dialogue. Uh, it's very important for our world to, to develop the culture of dialogue and I tried in my books and in my lectures uh, to, uh, to cultivate this uh, the philosophy of dialogue that uh, the difference uh, couldn't uh, be not a press, but also uh, also some complementarity, uh, some enrichment, uh, s perhaps. That's it. Uh, and uh, also, uh, you, you mentioned this uh, our uh, common teacher. It was a Jan Patochka. Um, today is the anniversary of his death. He uh, he was a great philosopher, and also is Václav Havel. He was the first spokesman of the initiative Charta 77 in 1977, and he died after being interrogated by the secret police 12 hours, and then he died on a heart attack, and it was March 13. So uh, these, two, uh, these two anniversaries are very important for me. Do you want to add something, Ambassador? Well, yeah, maybe a couple of words. Uh, it will have been 25 years since uh, uh, the Velvet Revolution this uh, uh, November and uh, that makes me realize that uh, uh, you know, we both and, and Václav Havel who was at the center of it uh, a part of a bigger story and, uh, and the story of the Velvet Revolution was a very optimistic story with uh, slogans like Love and truth must prevail over uh, lies and and, uh, hatred. Hatred. and <laughs> hatred. And uh, well, it may not have worked out all that way, uh, but uh, it's uh, it's it's an ongoing task. And 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 you know, some people. And I'm very grateful that that uh, we have people like uh, Tomas. Uh, uh, think of it as, as, as their duty to continue that task and uh, maybe bring it a, a, a little closer to, mm -hmm. to fruition. And Jan Patochka, whom you mentioned, uh, our, our teacher was at the core of it uh, uh, in the uh, commandment for, for bravery that uh, it, uh, it requires. He, one of his seminal essays, uh, at the time of the founding of Charter 77 was called uh, on the duty to resist injustice and 
And it was not uh, just Wales at the time, it was a very tough task. And uh, so, you know, we, we, we were very fortunate in having people like that to, to teach us and to walk in front mm -hmm. of us. The victory of truth and, and love is an eschatological goal, <laughs> but we must never, uh, uh, never stop uh, to, to try to Never stop trying. Yeah. Yeah. Who else would like to ask? Yes. There's Mike there, yeah. My name is Roger Trigg from the University of Oxford. Um, it's my impression, I don't know if you would agree with me, that the Czech Republic is a much more secular place than next door Slovakia. Uh, if you agree with that, what would be the reason for that, do you think? I think there are several reasons. One reason is the very complicated uh, religious history of our, of, uh, of our country. You know, the John Huss, I mentioned him, the Hussite Wars, the Crusaders against the Czech, the violent recotterization. And the Czech modern nationalism was born in the 19th century uh, as an instrument against Habsburg monarchy, so also against the austro catholicism so our uh, national identity have already uh, some uh, some this anti-clerical aspect and it was misused by the communists of course and uh, so i think that the communists uh, have chosen the czechoslovakia as a field for an experiment of a total atheization of the country. So every monastery were closed. Was, with one exemption, there was a, a little monastery near Prague, and there was a monk who slept from the ascetical reason in a coffin. And when the police came in the night, he stood up from the coffin and said, what is the matter? And, <laughs> and the police <laughs> disappeared with all these uh, guns and dogs. Uh, but <laughs> they stood up just, just one day. Uh, so uh, the, the persecution of, of the Czech really very hard in the 50s. Uh, then came the uh, Prague Spring, a little bit liberalization uh, period, and then uh, another 20 years of persecution, which was not so harsh, not so drastic as in Stalinist era, but more sophisticated. But now I think uh, that uh, I always say that the uh, uh, most widespread uh, religion in our country is some thinkness. The people say, I, I don't believe in God, I don't go in the church, but something must be. So this some thinkness is very widespread religion. But it's a task for a theologian to interpret this something. Because I think today the main line is not between believers and unbelievers, but between seekers and dwellers. So uh, the number of those who are dwellers, who are 100% identified with the church uh, institution and teaching is decreasing, but it's increasing the number of seekers. And it's also decreasing the number of the dogmatic atheists. Uh, the number of, of, of seekers is increasing. And I think it's a great task for the church to communicate with those seekers not only with, with the dwellers. Uh, it is the uh, topic of my, of, my, of my book, Patience with God. And I, I, I've got this uh, the picture, uh, the, the story from the, from the Gospel about Zacchaeus, uh, the tax collector who was uh, looking uh, at Jesus from, from a tree. And I, I, was, I was once invited to the Czech Parliament to give a meditation for the, uh, for the deputies and senators before Christmas. And I read this story of Zacchaeus, and I, say, and I said to them, them that it is the parable uh, of the situation of the church after the fall of communism, when we've got first time the opportunity to enter the public space, we have seen many people, they were applauding us. There were many, uh, not so many, they were against us. But the trees along the street was full, full of Zacchaeuses, of the people. They've got some interest, but uh, they need also to have some distance. And Jesus answered, called the Zacchaeus by name. 
And I think it's very important the church doesn't do it. And I tell the politicians, it's also a challenge for the politicians. Also, uh, many people are looking at a new democracy with great interest, but also with some distance. And it's important that, uh, that the politicians feel come to them, not only before elections, to communicate with them, to call them by name, to understand them, to discuss uh, with them. So I think it is, it is very important that in our country there are also the agnostic, there is a little bit of the apatheism also, the people that are apathetic to, 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 to religion. There's also uh, the religious analphabetism, but also this, this, this thumb-thinkness, and many people, they are spiritual. They have the distance from the organized religion, from the church, but they are spiritual, and they are our partners. You, you don't think you're going to get into trouble with the Vatican for choosing Jan Hus as one of your heroes, are you? He was, uh, he was not very popular in Rome. <laughs> uh, uh, Six years ago, uh, six hundred years ago, certainly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, but uh, uh, things uh, uh, have changed. Uh, I, I I wrote uh, in eighties one article in the uh, Samizdat uh, in this in the Samizdat in this uh, secret uh, uh, about Jan Hus and uh, uh, Jan Hus as a as a as a challenge for the Czech Catholicism, and uh, and we created uh, a group of theologians. Uh, Histor uh, historians uh, uh, studying uh, Jan Hus and a uh, little bit to, uh, to make a difference between Jan Hus as a historical figure, Jan Hus as a moral leader, and the image of Jan Hus in the context of the ideologies of the, uh, of the 19th and 20th century. And then, when I first met John Paul II, his, uh, almost his, his uh, first question was, what you will do with Jan Hus? And he said, uh, the only theologian who was defending Jan Hus and the Council of Constance was the theologian from Krakow and the Polish theologian. So it was, uh, it was really, uh, really uh, very important for, 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 for John Paul II. And then I inspired, I came with an idea uh, to organize a, a seminar, a conference in Vatican. Uh, it was just uh, at the eve of, uh, of, of the year 2000 about Jan Hus. Václav Havel was there and the Pope was there and, and Pope has a wonderful speech about Jan Hus. And uh, when uh, we uh, sat in the aula uh, in the Vatican, uh, we, were, um, uh, uh, we were singing uh, the song of Jan Hus. And, uh, and the Pope was coming and I came to him and I said, this is the song of Jan Hus. And he said, I know, I know, Jan Hus in Vatican. Who should say? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't tell us you did a good, very good turn as a, an imitator of Pope John Paul as well. <laughs> um, so a question down here, a uh, canon. In fact, one, one prize winner to another. Just hold on a second if you could and uh, wait for that. <coughs> Thank you. Yes, uh, Michael Bordeaux, uh, Keston Institute, Oxford, and Baylor University, Texas. This is one of the proudest days of my life, uh, not primarily. Um, Edward Sturton because of what you said at the beginning, although I'm very grateful for that. But uh, because of this, I would like to take you all back 30 years uh, to the equivalent press conference uh, when the prize was announced. Uh, it was uh, in the UN uh, building in New York. And one of the things that I said on that day that I shall never forget was, uh, the prize is going to the wrong person. It should be going to those in Eastern Europe, um, in the communist world, who on that very day were still suffering imprisonment and all kinds of uh, harassment for their faith in God and their deeds. I didn't name uh, any individuals, at least not as far as I remember, but it is a remarkable event today. Um, after 30 years of waiting for me, that one of the people um, whom 
we were supporting at Keston College, as it then was, uh, has now been awarded this wonderful Thank prize. Uh, I, I have not researched, uh, Professor Halleck, what uh, we did exactly on your behalf, uh, because that would have broken the embargo. Mm -hmm. Our archive uh, is in uh, America, Baylor University. But I would like to ask you um, whether uh, you were aware during those very difficult de decades after you came back uh, from studying at Bangor University to face whatever uh, you underwent during the next two decades, um, how much were you aware of uh, support, spiritual support, uh, particularly from the outside? Absolutely, it was uh, for us very important uh, to know there are people, they understand our situation and they are praying for us, they are trying to help us to send the literature. Uh, there were many theologians, they came as a private tourist to Prague, giving the lectures in the private flats. So we were not so isolated from the uh, modern contemporary thinking. And it was a great, great thing. And, and, and thank you, thank you, thank the uh, Kesten Institute and all our friends, they didn't for, forget us. Can I follow up on that with just a question, a sort of hard news question really, which is about what's happening in Ukraine at the moment. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. listening to you both talking about what happened in 1968, it's impossible not to be struck with some echoes of that. Do you, do you feel that when you watch events unfolding in Crimea and Kiev? Absolutely, absolutely. I, I, I think the great majority of our people, um, their heart is on the side of the Ukraine and, and the struggle for democracy and independence in Ukraine. We know what it is, the Russian occupation. And uh, I know that Mr. Putin, the former uh, KGB agent, has in his head also this old uh, Russian uh, imperialistic uh, dreams and uh, that uh, he has also an attempt to renew, uh, to renew uh, in a new form uh, the, the, the Soviet empire. So um, uh, under his, uh, he, he, he would like to inspire uh, all the attempts to dominate uh, the former uh, Soviet Republic and also to have some dominance over the, uh, the former satellites of the Soviet Union. So I think it's very, very dangerous and, I, and I, I'm, I'm convinced that we need very strong united Europe. It is very important uh, to have strong united Europe the European Union is a historical chance. First in the, in the history of Europe, the Europe is united not through one ideology, not through a dictator, but through the free will of the nations. And yes, there are many problems, there are many problems, of course, uh, but I think it's a unique chance and uh, we, 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 we need the united, strong Europe who is uh, uh, all the people with your skepticism and, and the people, uh, they, um, uh, they are so influenced by the, by the uh, national, uh, national egoism, uh, they are in fact supporting uh, Mr. Putin and his, 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 his plans. You've created several headlines there, I suspect, but Dr. <laughs> <laughs> the unfortunate part that um, you just have life things, end of meetings and that sort of thing. If dad was here, he was a person who was just totally captured by questions. And I think I've had a privilege of speaking and learning from somebody for whom questions are a real blessing. So I rather think that now that I know you a bit, you dad who goes to bed asking two questions and wakes up asking two questions. <laughs> so I'd like to offer one question, which is how free are youth in a free country? And therefore, in what context would it be okay for a youth to put forth in school or even talking to others? What is the basic essence of every single human person? Oh, <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a big one. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, could I write a book on this, thing, <laughs> on this topic? A <laughs> uh, little bit and the answer in one, in, 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 in in one minute. In a free country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, 
Um, so it's very important is the education, very important is the family, very important is the atmosphere of the society, um, all, 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 all those things. So, so yeah. Good. Perhaps. Good. But whether that's a blessing. We probably just got time for one or two. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, do you mind just waiting for the um, yeah. mic? When, uh. Thank you. Um, Bess Tristan Davis from Independent Catholic News website. And what I wanted to refer to, Dr. Templeton's, Templeton's comment that you were crucified between the paradoxes of the secular world and the world of religion. Could you give us an example of one of those paradoxes, please? Mm -hmm. Uh, I think it's something uh, very similar what uh, Pope Benedict said, that and, and also the John Paul II, that uh, reason and faith need each other. Sometimes I think that uh, faith and doubts need each other as a sister. They should uh, they should a little bit correct each other. That uh, that the uh, faith without doubts, without critical questions, could lead to, uh, to fundamentalism, fanaticism, but also the doubts that is not able and not prepared to doubt about their own doubts could lead to cynicism. So I think these both extremes are, are, uh, are uh, dangerous, that we need this dialogue, and this dialogue between the belief and, and non-belief, it's not a dialogue between two uh, ice hockey uh, teams. It's, it's in a dialogue inside of practically every, every human being inside his uh, head and, and, and heart. Uh, and I think it's very important to, to, to realize this this dialogue and uh, to, to accept also the open questions because uh, 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 science uh, sometimes is uh, uh, working with problems and problems could be solved uh, but, uh, but the religion uh, is concerned on the mystery and mystery is a bottom loss. Uh, is a mystery cannot be overcome, cannot be solved. Mystery is inviting us to go deeper and deeper, to find a new and new interpretations. And, um, and, and this is uh, so interesting and so dramatic for, for, for the faith, for the theology, for the philosophy. Uh, I, I think faith is here not to give us certainties, but to learn us to live with a mystery and to live us also with all these paradoxes of life. And I think it, it could be perhaps some uh, important inspiration from the Christianity from the other continents. I've got some friends, uh, the Japanese Christian, and they told me, so the many sentences of Jesus are practically koans. You know, it's a paradoxes. And uh, the first will be the last and, and so on. It's a paradoxes. Uh, we cannot just uh, to put it in, um, in some uh, uh, syllogism and so we must jump uh, with, 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 uh, into this mystery. And like the Kierkegaard uh, was saying already, of course. Uh, so I, I think this courage to enter this cloud of mystery and to live with the mystery is a very important for, for, for the life, especially for the life in this ambivalent world of today. I suspect we'd go on for ages, but we've actually amazingly been talking for nearly an hour. So I think I'd better ask Dr. Templeton to say a few words to close the event. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so I would like mm -hmm. to also thank not only our honoree this year, but all of you for attending this press conference, including attending electronically. Um, this is particularly valuable from my father's viewpoint, if he could be here with you all sharing not just your questions, but some of your insights. My father concluded these press conferences each year, however, with something to take with you that is an appeal for help. First of all, to appeal to you not just today, not just what you may publish and so on, but help for wisdom, insights, and especially for advice about how we can, or you can, in different ways, bless others. If in this spirit my father were here today, he would earnestly ask all of you here, and also those watching us on the webcast today or in the future, please consider Professor Heilich and his remarkable con contributions 
as an inspiration for all of us here, and especially in our global audience, to carefully ponder and then submit a worthy nominee for next year. So I would like to ask, how many 10, 20, or billions nominators are there in the world? Well, if you take out the children, five billion. But we hope that you see yourselves or that you talk with others in which everyone in the world, which I think may be different from virtually every other prize that I can think of, are really potential nominators. This is so because the very qualities that are recognized of the, pri of the prize are wide concerns and are thus deeply relevant to every human in the world, which was a bit why I asked, is it okay for a 14-year-old to ask a question even as staggering as, what is the essence of every single human person? So candidates for the prize whom my father called entrepreneurs of the spirit come in many forms. Some distinguish themselves through insight or discovery, others through practical works, but all seek a deeper understanding of life's dimensions, especially those that are in, uh, not only of the moment, but that are inherent opportunities where the mind and the heart can expand. So therefore, not only of you all in this room, but those who are listening and beyond, help us to continue to find remarkable persons and thereby seek to find ways to honor them and the contributions that they are making. You can learn more about the prize program and its objectives and the criteria for making nominations, which are very straightforward. These are specifics provided on the website for the prize, which is www.templetonprize.org. Thus, in addition to sharing your thoughts with us, we do indeed look forward to your range of nominations for the next cycle, which are due for the next cycle, next year, is July 1st this year. And thus, in Sir John's long-standing voice, thank you to our winner this year, Professor Tomix Hai, and especially to all of the innov innovative leaders today. So thank you, and thank you so much again. You, you mentioned, mentioned the website. I've been asked to add that, of course, the story goes on, and you can follow it um, hashed on Twitter, hashtag 2014 Templeton Prize. And I'll just add, on a personal note, you made me feel rather guilty, Monsignor, because you mentioned Graham Greene, and we used to, I did um, The Power and the Glory for O-Level, and we used to moan like mad about having to study this book. Now I like him, but then he was a bore. And I think if we'd, if we'd known that for people like you, in the Czechoslovakia at the time, it really meant so much. We would have studied it with rather more enthusiasm. But anyway, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.